you're watching Grassroots Community TV, the nation's original community-operated television station, protecting and nurturing open channels of communication for the citizens of the Roaring Fork Valley since 1972. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is our first Liberty Salon in a series that we're putting on this summer. Uh, we've got an inspiring uh, man in the house, Robert Egger, here. Uh, I'm gonna briefly introduce him and then give him the mic. Uh, I met Robert about a year ago here, and he actually had the idea for the Gonzo Museum. And the idea was to be able to show people this great art in a cool place and let people get inspired by the art. And then uh, during my book tour, we went to DC and Robert pulled out all the stops. And um, briefly, he founded DC Central Kitchens, which is a nonprofit that basically takes food that is normally gonna be wasted or thrown away and then repurposed uh, to feed the homeless. And the interesting trick about it was teaching homeless people how to repurpose the food and then uh, feed others. Um, and probably served over a million, how many meals? 25, 25 mil. 25 million meals to the homeless. Um, and then additionally... <laughs> Better too. Uh, additionally, he... Uh, <laughs> and, um, his rec recent initiative is um, a pack called Sea Forward, which is a... Um, a group that champions the role of nonprofits in the community. And um, Robert's done a lot to basically bring together nonprofits around the country and uh, create some goals and to unify uh, people. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, Joel, can you grab in the far underneath cabinet? There's a little gift for Robert. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, we just want to thank Robert for his uh, sort of uh, vision. And uh, I think he has a lot of other ideas and visions that are sort of um, powerful and could help change the world. Um, so this is our little gift from the Gonzo Museum. Oh, dude, thank you so very much. Oh, um, oh tequila, my favorite. And <laughs> Life is good. And, uh, uh, it's going to be a fun Saturday night. <laughs> uh, the, night we, we, the, the, night, the night we met, we uh, uh, talked about the finer points of life. And uh, I learned more about tequila uh, from Robert than I had learned before. So on that note, I'm going to hand it off. Uh, Robert, thank you for coming. A pleasure, man. Hope you guys all enjoy the first Liberty Salon. Yay! Yay. Yay. Well, it's a, it's a big old giant fat honor uh, to be here and actually to be kind of kicking it off. I mean, you know, it's a real cool thing that uh, the DJ uh, and the community have pulled off here. You know, um, it was my birthday when we met, uh, kind of a fortuitous night because I had been out to Woody Creek, like many uh, men of my age, women too, but I think there's a, a bond, if you will, with anybody who grew up kind of reading The Doctor. Um, and like many people, I was invited to speak at the Aspen Institute, and I, I really took the gig primarily so I could go pay homage to The Doctor um, out at Woody Creek. And when I was out there, and what I eventually told uh, DJ over a conversation was how I envied, wanted, desired, coveted um, a Hunter S. Thompson for Sheriff poster. And that's when <laughs> this young guy who just saddled up on the bar next to me, um, and we just started talking, he wheeled around, and thus began a very interesting journey uh, in which not only did he reveal the fact that we shared this interest, but he had somehow hoarded um, all of the, as many of these things as he could get. And then we talked about what now, what next? Uh, and that's where I think this idea was, was kind of, uh, uh, birth. But it's interesting because when I left that night and staggered back to the Aspen Institute, um, I made a decision uh, because, um, like I said, like many people, as somewhat of a sojourner or a pilgrim, I came here, I, you know, again, I was very honored to be asked to speak for the Aspen Institute. It's a big deal. But like I said, there was a little bit of a sojourn for me. I was looking for something, and I think I found it here because, you know, Hunter has one of his great lines, obviously, is when the going get weird, the weird turn pro. 
And I'd like to flip it around a little bit uh, and just say, in fact, when the pro, when the going gets pro, the pro turned weird. Because I'm a pro. Um, <laughs> I'm a serious pro. Thank you, my friend. Um, uh, <laughs> I have been, I ran nightclubs coming up. That was my great goal. I saw the movie Casablanca, and all I wanted to do was open a nightclub. <laughs> no, but get this. Um, I saw Casablanca right after we moved from Southern California to D.C. And it was in the early 70s, um, right after kind of everything came crashing down. I was 10 uh, in 1968 when Robert Kennedy was assassinated in L.A. Um, and to my young mind, I was um, really kind of confused as a 10-year-old why both he and Dr. King, young men, um, how these words, how these ideas of theirs had gotten everybody so worked up. Um, to the point where they were both murdered two months apart. A visceral wound that I think still reverberates in this country. But as a 10-year-old, again, I could not figure out what they had said or done that had caused so much trouble. Again, the idea of people getting beyond race, gender, even uh, generations, and finding common cause seemed a pretty good deal to me. Um, but interesting enough, my father, who was a naval aviator, um, he and his squadron mates were having a big party a couple of months later. And I remember vividly as a kid watching them dance. Uh, and listening to Motown, and as my ears were listening, I was thinking, you know, all these guys are dancing and having a great old time to music that is essentially saying the same thing Dr. King was saying and Robert Kennedy was saying, but they're accepting it and they're opening up to it. So that's when, for me, the power of music was revealed, and that was what I wanted to channel through a nightclub. The nightclub was just a shell. It was just a place to conduct shows, shows that would kind of take the same ideas that are talked about in this room um, and that men and women died talking about. Try and find a way to get these ideas that people were afraid of to somehow be palatable, something they could accept in a, in a form, if you will, that seems safe. Entertainment, uh, music, theater, art, dance, comedy um, are perfect shields. Um, in fact, you see what Jon Stewart does on a nightly basis with comedy. That interested me. And then when I saw Casablanca and this powerful use of a nightclub in which if you just wanted a night on the town, you know, if you were just trying to find a place to let go of the burden of being a refugee on the road, you could go into Rick's and have that great night. It functioned at, at the highest level. It was the only nightclub to go to, but right below the surface. Um, again, I'm watching this. My mother had sat us down because I was a little bit depressed. I was on the cusp of being a teenager when I was kind of plucked from the beaches of Southern California and deposited like the Beverly Hillbillies in reverse mm -hmm. in, a, in about 40 miles south of Washington, D.C. in the Virginia woods. Uh, and I was really depressed. And my mom said, sit down, let's watch this movie together. And that's when I saw Rick's. And to me, that's where it all came together. So as a young man at age 13, I basically decided I'm going to open the greatest nightclub in the world. And that's what I did. I ran nightclubs all through my 20s. And I had a glorious time going from not only kind of the punk movement of the mid-70s, but then, towards the end of my career, as I started really looking at how do you bring people in who will spend a couple hundred dollars a night, I discovered jazz. Not that I particularly liked the music, but I just discovered the clientele in the clubs, and I started to work there, and I was lucky because I got to see the last swing of some of the great acts, Sarah Vaughan, Oscar Peterson, Mel Torme, Rosemary Clooney. And I was 23, 24 years old, meeting these men and women who could speak with such amazing passion about not only the music, <clears throat> but also the clubs they played in. So I'm swimming along um, and was asked one night to go out and feed the homeless, much against my will. I'm somewhat of a recovering hypocrite uh, in that I had spent so much of my youth dreaming of bringing people together with the power of music, yet, like many people, when asked, hey, do you want to go out and serve some of the men and women who were homeless on the streets of Washington? Um, young people have grown up with homelessness, but it was still somewhat new. There were always people on the fringe. But to see men and women sleeping uh, in front or behind the White House or in front of the Capitol and all of the steam grates, that was new. And like many people, you would walk by, you know, kind of hoping somebody would do something, trying to make enclave, you know, trying not to be too much of a jerk, but at the same time, keeping my distance. Um, and again, asked to go out one night and found, tried to find every which reason I could avoid going out on this truck. And I was able to avoid this, this uh, entrapment uh, for a couple of months. And I eventually got pulled out on this truck. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't look in the eyes of a homeless person and my life was changed as much as I asked a very simple question. You know, where's the food come from uh, on the way out? Just trying to mask my nervousness. And was told, oh, it's purchased at the Safeway in Georgetown, which is probably the most expensive store on the East Coast. 
And I'm thinking, wow, okay, I work in a business that throws away a ton of food every night. You know, and they're nice people. They're not laughing maniacally and throwing legs of land in the dumpster at two in the morning. This is just the culture of food service. There was plenty of it, and there was a sense of, this is America. It doesn't matter. It's cheap, and there's more where that came from. Just throw it away. So I kept thinking, man, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, universities, farmers are throwing away tons of this great food. What would it be like if you could get that food and bring it to a central hub? But what interested me more was when we pulled up in between the State Department and George Washington University on the street corner, here were this line of men and women stretched all the way down and up the street waiting in the rain, much like tonight, you know, waiting for this truck to show up. And we dutifully pulled up and slid the windows open and started serving this line. And as people went by, conversations began, people said, thank you. I was really, it, it, in other words, all the fears I had were mitigated. But at the same time, I couldn't help but hear at the end of the line, the driver, who seemed to know everybody by name, calling out and saying, I'll see you tomorrow night, I'll see you tomorrow night. And I kept thinking, at the, you know, trying to mind my own business, but at the same time, confused. It's like, wow, this is an interesting setup here. We're, we're buying food to give it away to people standing in the rain who are going to wander for somewhere in 24 hours and come back here so another group of people can come out and serve people in the rain. Then I kept thinking at the end of the night, I had been the one who was served. Um, so I went home and came back a couple weeks later with a business plan based on FedEx. Brand new business plan, business idea that used Memphis, Tennessee as a hub. And I just did the same thing and said, what if we create FedEx for food? But instead of serving the poor, what happens if we bring people in out of the rain and in effect erase the false divide of the person with a job serving the poor and bring everybody around to the same side of the table and see if we could explore a different set of relationships and a different, a different equation. That's what interests me. Um, what's already there and how can you use it differently? So I propose this idea, and I'll be honest with you, I had no intention of doing it, but I was shocked at how quickly I was rebuffed, how rigid the people I presented this idea to, that the, the charities, and these are decent, kind people, do not get me wrong, but all the different groups that I had assembled to try and pr present this plan that would allow people to feed more people better food for less money, but more importantly, shorten the line by the way you serve it. I was told it wouldn't work. The health department wouldn't let you. Of course, there was a law that actually facilitated it in every state, and I just, I had a lot of, I was prepared to answer almost any question, but I was unprepared for the tenacity people held on to these stereotypes about training the homeless. I was told, in effect, I was naive to think you could do that. And that just shocked me. Um, I was unprepared for that. I just assumed there'd be kind of a by any means necessary attitude. Um, and I was troubled, and I went home thinking, man, they're not going to do this. And this is one of those crossroads moments um, where I had to make a decision in my life. And now, I'll be honest with you, I just thought I'd get started and going back to um, running nightclubs and fulfilling my destiny. But the kitchen had pulled me um, joyfully in a very interesting direction, unexpectedly. We opened up, uh, opened up on George Bush Sr.'s inauguration day. George Bush Sr. was the first donor food. I remember know how to do a show. Uh, and that's the idea. Imagine what media outlet could resist images of the parties from the inauguration and the food going to men and women who were homeless. It was, it was a slam dunk. So on opening day, not only did we open our organization and kind of tear down this myth that it was against the law to donate food, the President of the United States just did it. Not only did it open the door for us, but it opened the door for anybody. And that became somewhat of a imprimatur of the DC Central Kitchen. This idea that if we could avoid the trap of thinking we could fix the problem as much as reveal powerful ingredients that existed right here in our community, every single thing that we've used over the past 20 years was already there. We take food our society threw away, people our society undervalue, um, chefs who have food but also have jobs and will help teach, agencies that desperately want to use their money to liberate people, um, volunteers, an army of people looking to make a difference in their community. It was all there. All I did was come along and move the pieces around. And what it revealed was an amazing potential, that if you take the idea of charity in America and you scramble it up and you're not burdened, if you will, by by silos or, or, to a certain extent, traditions. And you could look at it with a fresh eyes. It was amazing the potential it had. So what I've been doing over the past 23 years is building what is, and I say this without hubris, this a pretty darn perfect nonprofit. You know, we do about 6,000 meals a day every single day of the week. We've never closed, 365 days a year. We just graduated our 89th or 88th class. We just started class 89. Every year, the men and women who go through our job training program, it costs about $8,000 per student to train them. So that's 800 large 
That's a lot of money to train 80 men and women for jobs. But the majority of the men and women who go through our program are men and women who are out of prison. And if they didn't have a program at the kitchen or some of our revenue generating businesses that actually employ some of the men and women who are just virtually impossible to find employment for, they go back to prison and they cost us 45 grand a pop. Now, collectively, they're earning $2 million in new salaries. They're paying $225,000 in payroll taxes. We support local farmers to the tune of about $400,000 a year to do contracts to provide cook from scratch locally sourced meals for DC public schools. We have branched out in so many directions and exposed, again, the power that was always there. Um, and whether it's some of the things we do, um, again, our revenue generating business, there's 60 some cities that have done something like this. We're open source and just wanted to give it away. We have a thing, campus kitchens. 60, uh, there's 60,000 school cafeterias in America. You know, and I just started noticing all these kids were coming through the DC Central Kitchen to get community service hours. 14,000 people a year come through and volunteer. And I kept looking and thinking, wow, think about this. The old formula has all those students leaving school and coming to the charity, oftentimes coming to the downtown of DC, only reinforcing very, very outdated stereotypes about hunger and where it's at. Um, and I kept thinking, wow, think about this. There's a cafeteria in their school. What would it be like if, again, we just try and saw it a different way and took the nonprofit to the school? And thus was born Campus Kitchens. There's now 33 of these, and this idea is quite profound because it takes existing school cafeterias and uses them not only as places where students can do after school work, they can get service you know, on campus. Oftentimes in a university setting, recycling food from campus, bring it to a central hub, and then serving it in the meeting community. But now, after 10 years, what students have done um, under our, our basic motto of anything short of felony is fine with us, <laughs> What these students have done have revealed the power of a generation coming up, a generation 90 million strong. There are 90 million people under 25. This election cycle, there'll be 16 million new 18-year-olds. This is the most diverse generation in the history of America. This is a generation raised doing service. Never before have this many people been raised, trying to be exposed to different ways in which their life and the, and the lives of the larger community can intersect. And not only that, but with this, this generation is the most technologically advanced generation ever. The ability to communicate globally with a global generation of people who are young, poor, and pissed off. And they are coming every single day. And that idea of trying to find them early and wrestle from them this notion that on graduation day, and I'm lucky, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm very lucky because I didn't go to college. But thanks to the joy of commencement addresses, you're looking at doctor, 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 Edgar. <laughs> God bless America. Feed the poor, get to be a doctor. Um, but it's fascinating almost every single day in America. You know what we say every year? To, in fact, this spring, two million young people graduated college. And you know what we say pretty much? Congratulations. You know, coming out of some of the best school systems for all its wrinkles, still one of the greatest educational systems ever seen. Um, and you've been raised in service. You know, but guess what? Today you have to choose. Do you want to make money or do you want to do good deeds? Do you want to be a dot com or a dot org? And that notion, that antiquated notion, that addiction, if you will, to the silly notion of a dot, you know, that we're telling people you have to choose between integrity and a paycheck. And it's a fool's errand. And what I'm trying to do and what I hope more and more people will do is try and liberate a younger generation of people from thinking they have to choose. They don't. And you're already seeing ample evidence of this all over the globe and in every city in America where young men and women are, again, taking apart the whole idea of philanthropy, um, taking some of the rudimentary ideas that people like myself and others around the country did with early adaption of social enterprise, the idea of generating money ourselves. We earn almost 70% of our own income now doing a variety of different contracts. As I mentioned earlier, school food, meals on wheels, catering, contract food service. We do all kinds of things, again, to be a little bit more independent. But this all came to a head for me because I had been thinking for a while uh, about the role I play in Washington, D.C. and the role charities play all over America. I had been on the road recently and I was in Missoula, Montana. And I was walking down the street much like I did tonight and I looked at the Chamber of Commerce had a big sign in their window. Top 10 reasons you should relocate your business to Montana. You know, number one, access to quality health care. Number two, access to higher education. Number four, arts and culture. Number seven, our beautiful environment. 
number 10 communities of faith. Half of the top 10 reasons that you can come and make money in Missoula is nonprofits, the work we do. And we've never really owned that as a sector, and we've never even explored it as a country. And this is very much germane to my conversation tonight. Because again, as I said, I'm very good at what I do. And I'm surrounded by people who are very good at what they do. And I travel throughout America and I meet people equally, if not better, at what they do. Yet, the two people running for president of the United States, not one, and none of the campaign has mentioned philanthropy or the idea of what are we doing with an entire generation raised doing service. And I'll tell you, again, this came for a head, to head for me because we had the first family come and visit the D.C. Central Kitchen. We have a long history of presidents coming to work at the D.C. Central Kitchen. And at one level, it exposes the real powerful image of what we do because, I'll be honest with you, Bill Clinton, um, who came to the kitchen on numerous occasions, probably next to Barack Obama, one of the smartest men ever to inhabit the Oval Office. Dude didn't know how to cut a carrot. Uh, <laughs> the power of the D.C. Central Kitchen is a person who was in a prison or a person who was an addict or a person who was up in that shelter just trying to hold on, saying to the President of the United States, no, sir, you cut it this way. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a skill. A great nonprofit doesn't fix the pro try and fix the world. It reveals what's there and just shows you a new way to organize it. That's what interests me. But the President came only one day after an amazing and impassioned speech before the Joint Houses of Congress about the essential need to create jobs in America. Obviously, we've come out of a time, and it was just recently discussed that um, between 2005 and 2010, Americans lost 40% of their wealth. You know, city after city in America is having to make really staggering, tough choices about what comes next. So as you can imagine, the kitchen was abuzz <coughs> at the notion of the first family coming to visit and work with us for a day. Now again, as you can imagine, for men and women who've been in prison just a year earlier, and we have men and women in our program who spent decades in prison and the notion that they can probably still, as I can imagine, um, go back to that moment where they were deep down in the belly of the beast, imagining there was no exit ever. And here they are, somehow magically transported, working next to not only the President of the United States, but for the predominantly African-American staff that we employ, the first elected black man in America as the President of the United States. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And it was joyful to watch that happening, but I was lying in wait for the president because I wanted to talk about the fact that we have added 75 jobs this year. And I had crossed my fingers and doubled down hard and sent as much advance work as I could to the White House, hoping that this was going to be the magic moment when a president of the United States would come out to the assembled press corps and say, I have seen the future and there are no dots. I was just working in an organization that created 75 jobs, paying men and women good wages with full benefits. Men and women who used to tear up the town, now they're serving healthy, healthy meals to DC public school kids. Men and women who are taking care of their own families. Men and women who are paying taxes. Again, my economic plan doesn't have dots. My economic plan just has any business that's a creating job. Well, I'll be honest with you, we didn't do that. That was quite a letdown. The president walked out and basically said, my wife and I are really thrilled for the opportunity to come down here and volunteer and help serve the hungry. Now, it's a beautiful thing. There's never anything wrong with basically taking time out of your day to make sure somebody else in the community has something basic. But what a missed opportunity. And that's why I was here. To, that's one of the things I'm here to talk about. Um, this idea of gonzo philanthropy, this idea that what we do um, won't work the way it is. There's something beautiful here, something deeply American. De Tocqueville marveled when he came through the states in the early 1800s at this sense of connectivity we have as a people, marveled at it. We're the only country that over for the, you know, literally the last 100 years has incentivized and rewarded everyday citizens for contributing to making their community a better place to live. But the sense of maybe we could do more, maybe we have to do more. I'll be honest with you, charity in America, when Hunter S. Thompson and uh, Mr. Bellow, or Mr. Benton were working in this building and fomenting revolution. You know, America had only about 70,000 nonprofit organizations. You know, most charities were limited to the Y, the Bowery Missions, the Goodwills, the, the, the United Ways, what they used to call the Community Chest of the Red Feather. There was an explosion of nonprofits in the 1970s when, to a certain extent, a lot of people let go of the dream 
And we started convincing ourselves that if we just wrote checks and sent them off, somehow things would fix themselves. And to a certain extent, charities allowed that fiction to continue. We gladly took the checks from people who lived in northern Virginia or suburban Maryland and let them think that somehow we were making the ills of inner city D.C. somehow go away. Now, we were doing good work. Do not get me wrong. Every single day, we were sending powerful ripples out, powerful ripples of hope and resurrection, redemption, um, unity. But again, that's this notion that we haven't really stopped and thought, is there something more we can do with this? Now, I'll be honest with you, much like starting the D.C. Central Kitchen, this isn't something I really wanted to do. But I'm a father. I'm a citizen. And I'm somebody who works hard. And I believe that as a country, our future isn't in, again, this idea that we can rebuild the economy, A, the way it was, but rebuild it with this false line, this idea of .com.org. And that's why I've tried to set out and launch a new political action committee. It's called See Forward, and it's a very simple idea. There's 10 million men and women who work at a nonprofit every single day, and over 75 million people every single year who come out and through acts of volunteerism try and not only make their community better, but clearly look for something inside. They want, they yearn for something. And I'll be honest with you, outside today, the farmer's market, farmer's markets in town across America, those aren't about food. That's about community. People are looking to tribe up again. You know, it's been 40 years almost, or a little bit over, since that summer in 1968 when Dr. King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. And generations, every single morning, it's the one you can't hear a sigh, you put your head out the window, every single morning is 10,000 people wake up 66 years old. Every single morning, 10,000 people look in the mirror and sigh and think, man, how did I get so tricked into thinking if I just bought more junk, I'd be happy. And you see them coming every single day, programs like the D.C. Central Kitchen, an army of people, the silver tsunami, if you will, people who were saying, in effect, it's not too late. I don't want to go back to the 60s. As much as I admire and love to read about and see these posters on the wall of a time in which a small ragtag army raged against the machine. I'm interested in taking over the town. As I love to say, why occupy the streets when you can take over the city? And that's what we're talking about. This army of people for whom the only future of philanthropy is going to be the way they spend their money every day. That's a lot of what we've been exploring at the D.C. Central Kitchen with our revenue-generating businesses. And I'll be honest with you, it's an amazing program. You know, oh, by the way, I have to stop. Somebody told me the other day, I say I have to be honest with you way too much, and it implies that I've been lying. So I've got to quit. <laughs> then I remember not to say that anymore. But I was recently up in Ithaca, uh, New York, um, college town, and I was um, asked to go see a program called Finger Lakes Fresh. And it's a program that works with men and women who are developmentally disabled. And I got in the car with the executive director of the program, and I'll be, um, he had kind of got on my, uh, uh, yeah, um, my tell. Um, he had got kind of on my nerves, I'll be honest with you. Um, in the course of us getting ready to go, he had tugged on me a little bit. And I don't know how many of you all have waited on tables. I've been in service all my life. I still dress like a waiter. Um, <laughs> But he tugged on my, my sleeve, and that really, i got to tell you, anybody who's waited on tables knows that, that's a no-no, you know. So anyway, I got in the car with him, and I was a little miffed, and he started talking about the fact that since we quit institutionalizing men and women who were developmentally disabled in the 1960s, and now you have to be a danger to yourself or others before you can be committed against your will. Well, we, re we replaced that not with the kind of community-based treatment we had dreamed of, but with millions of parents taking care of their children. And Finger Lakes Fresh is a program that decided um, when they realized that there was going to be an army of older people who were terrified what happens to my son and daughter when I die. And I got to be honest with you, I, 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 um, I thought I was pretty in touch. You know, I've done this business a lot, but I was floored by that reality. I never thought about that. And that's what we said, you know, that's what my business is about. You know, we got a greenhouse, uh, Cornell College gave us an old greenhouse that we retrofitted. And we turned it into a hydroponic uh, bok choy, bib lettuce. We grow a variety of things. And we sell it through a grocery store chain, Wegmans, which is a, a kind of a semi-fancy West Coast, East Coast. Uh, and they're trying to differentiate themselves from other businesses. Again, acknowledging this notion that for businesses to compete anymore in America, whether it's a younger generation coming up or another generation, again, looking back hard in the mirror, more and more and more, the price of doing business in communities is going to be how much you put back into that community. 
You know, so Wegmans wanted to try and differentiate themselves, so they featured Finger Lakes Fresh as one of their products. And again, at the end of the day, what they're saying is, and you come here, this is the kind of business we do, but if you buy this salad, you know, and you just go home and make a healthy dinner, you're helping a senior, some parent, rest in peace. You know, that's a profound idea. You know, the notion that the way you spend your money, the way, the dinner you make, you know, can be difference between not knowing where that food comes from or not caring, and knowing the fact that you not only got something healthy for yourself, but you helped somebody else out. That's a powerful idea. And that's what interests me. How do we pry that open and make that the norm? Now, again, I've been working really hard, along with thousands of other people, trying to present through speeches, through video, um, through presidents visiting, this option. But it's got to the point where we just can't wait and hope this happens anymore. We have to go out and go to a place nonprofits have been fear to go. Uh, and again, this is kind of where I'm coming from with this gonzo approach. You know, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. And the time has come for nonprofits to kind of throw off, if you will, the shackles that have said, look, we'll make money off your work, art galleries, educational facilities, health care. But the only thing we're going to give you in return is some grants. And we're never going to give you the money you really need to be free. You're never going to have access to capital. And you can't be political. The time has come for us to push back. Not in a 1960s way, but in a very intelligent process that says to any candidate, particularly those running for mayor, look, you've got a choice. And it's real simple. And here's a classic example of it. You've got this many old people in your town. This many of them have enough money to live comfortably without support the rest of their lives. You know, and there's going to be for-profit companies that come in and make money off those people, and they're going to take that money and leave town, leaving you holding the bag along with a bunch of charities for the staggering number of older people who will not have enough money to live the 10 extra years that science has afforded them. And they're going to come knocking on your door every single day, Mr. Mayor, saying raise taxes so we can keep this threadbare charity machine going and try and feed working people odds and ends we get from restaurants. Or, right now, you can do away with this idea of dots and you can start to help a nonprofit like the DC Central Kitchen evolve into something much different, an organization that can serve both, that can serve those men and women who have the resources, but then take that money and reinvest it over here to mitigate the cost of caring for those who can't. That's the future. And it's right here in front of us. But again, it's going to take not just that idea of crossing your fingers, not this idea of just being passive and thinking somebody should go do it. It's stepping out and pushing up a little bit and saying, in effect, this is business. I always say, man, I have no interest in right, left. I have no interest in good, bad. I do smart, dumb. You know, and what we're talking about is smart business for America. You know, charity in America is 10, I mean, there's 10 million people who work at nonprofits. Every year, Americans give $300 billion to charity. We have $3 trillion in assets. 70 million people volunteer. Imagine, imagine what we could do if we went beyond this. And again, instead of thinking charity has this role, it must go out and nurture and do good deeds, and business does this. Imagine this option we have of putting the two together. That's what I'm interested in. To a certain extent, it's a little bit of a pushback on the, on the whole Milton Friedman concept, that the number one goal of a business is to make a whole bunch of money for its stockholders. Now, again, I'm a good capitalist. Yahoo. You want to do that? That's fine. But I'm a consumer, and I don't have to participate. This is what Gandhi did. You know, years ago, and what got me on this journey was reading, I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Begging for Change. Uh, and it was talking, and I took a little bit of a hard tone and i got to be honest with you, I got a little bit up on a high horse about the nonprofits right after it. I don't know if you can see this. I got a little heart tattooed on my finger here because I spent too many years doing this, you know? And I wanted from now on, anytime I do that, I want to realize, no, 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 wait a second. Most people aren't nearly as dumb or as bad as you think. They're just lost. They're just afraid. You know, most people in America are decent people, but they'd rather think if you're in prison, you deserve it. If you're hungry, you're just lazy. You know, they want to hold on tight to that. So it's almost the same thing I wanted to set out to do with my nightclub and music I've tried to do with food. But now I'm trying to do it with money and saying, what a powerful opportunity. When I was writing this book, I read a little footnote that talked about the British occupation of India. You know, and the British never, ever had more than 3,000 officers ever stationed in India, ever. 3,000 white dudes basically dominated 350 million people for, an entire half, for a century on an entire half continent. How? 
I went to India basically to try and figure that out and I was actually embarrassed because within about 24 hours of arriving in Nehru's home, walking through a gallery somewhere like this, I realized in looking at historic documents how obvious. As long as the British could keep Indians divided by faith, geography, caste, language, and fighting each other was a piece of cake. And in Nehru's home, I laughed out loud because I realized, oh my goodness, that's the nonprofit sector in America. That's us. And I came back and I launched the first ever nonprofit congress in 2006. And the idea was very simple. It started to say, look, there's an amazing crossroads right up ahead. If charities can just let go of the notion that somehow we can take the odds and ends of societies and fix larger problems and start to embrace something different, we can take a very different road. You know, America generated a huge amount of extra between 1950 and the year 2000. You know, after World War II, an army came home for the first time in the history of the world, didn't go back to the farm. That had never, ever happened. We started to march away from the agri culture. And we produced the food that fed the world. And because of the rest of the world's industrial base was pretty much in shambles, our washing machines, our cars, we sold the world everything they needed. And that produced gargantuan extra to the point where charity could grow again from 70,000 nonprofits to a million and a half. Because there was a lot of extra buildings, there was extra food, there was extra money. You know, but that era of extra is over. But what Gandhi proved by picking up a handful of salt on the beach, he held it out to Indians and said, in effect, you know, look, the British make us buy salt from them. You know, it's illegal in my own country as an Indian to breach down and pick up natural salt on the beach. In doing that, I broke the law. But the reality is there's 350 million people, 350 million of us. If we all pick up salt, there's not enough jail cells to hold us all. And even though it only costs rupees, pennies to buy it, if 350 million people don't buy it, it'll have a ripple. They were all, he was also surrounded by Indians, I mean by women and untouchables, saying in effect, look, this isn't about men, this isn't about lawyers in Delhi, this is about all of India. More importantly, he was holding out his hand to the British. He knew British media was there. And he was saying, in effect, this is the price of your, of your system, my subjugation. You know, is this you, who you want to be? It's a powerful thing. And he used the boycott, the boycott of salt, to get the British crown to the negotiating table, something they had been unable to do with every act of terror they could come up with over 100 years. Dr. King, a couple of uh, years later, took the same idea and the dimes it took to ride a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and started something that no one ever thought would happen. Cesar Chavez took the same idea and using table grapes. All three men used the idea of the boycott as a way to prove the power of poor people's pennies if pooled. Now, I'll be honest with you, did it again. Um, as a young man watching this, I became really intrigued by the idea of nonviolence. Because, you know, we grew up kind of thinking nonviolence means they didn't hit anybody. You know, but anytime you coerce behavior, it's a form of violence, if you follow me. So I became very intrigued, though. These men proved a massive point. But what would happen if that magic moment they had flipped this idea from the boycott to the boycott? If they rewarded and incentivized businesses that did good? That's kind of what interests me here. You know, this idea, and this is what social enterprises around America and around the world have been proving every single day, that there's something here that the way people spend their money every day. Imagine if charity said to their volunteers, all 70 million of them, you know, when you leave here, imagine if we had a seal of approval that said, every, you know, that, that nonprofits got together and we created for businesses and said, every time you shop and you look for that seal, these are businesses that pay a good wage. These are businesses that have proven green policies. These are businesses that reinvest in the community. Every time you shop there, you decrease the need for me. Every time you shop there, you decrease the need for taxes. Every time you spend your money there, you put more money in the treasury. You know, imagine that power. This is the kind of thing I'm hoping nonprofits really embrace. But more than anything else, now is the time for us to start to pool our votes. This pack that I've launched isn't trying to compete, isn't trying to be a super pack, isn't trying to raise millions of dollars. All I'm doing is saying if 10 million people openly communicate through Twitter as private citizens, something they've never been able to do, saying in effect there's a candidate in this town running for mayor, running for city council, running for state legislature, running for governor, and ultimately running for the President of the United States. 
and their vision for America isn't divided by dot com, dot com. Their vision for America is about anybody creating a job. They're saying to a younger generation who are graduating from these colleges, if you want to make that kind of money in this town, I'll help you. You know, if you want to launch one of these businesses, bring it on. Saying to nonprofits, if you want to move from this, this older and respected service model and start to embrace an empowerment model, we'll help you get there. We'll give you the capital you need to get there. You have to elect people like that. And we're about to unveil our first 10 candidates that we're actually endorsing. And this is a first. No nonprofit PAC has ever done this. You know, this idea that we can move beyond subsector issues of art and housing and AIDS and all these other things that have kept all this money and kept us fighting each other. If we can all embrace this one unifying idea that ultimately all of us rise up when we elect people who on day one show up saying, I'm ready, bring it on. You got an idea how to create a job. You got an idea how to save a buck. You got an idea how to keep the money local. I am all ears. We're particularly focusing on people who would appoint a liaison to work every single day with the nonprofit sector, saying, in effect, look, nonprofits, you bring more money probably from outside the city than any other organization into the city. I want this person to work with you every single day. How can you work together? How can you partner, merge, whatever it takes to double the amount of money you got coming in? <coughs> Mayor Hickenlooper in Denver, before he became governor, was one of the first mayors to embrace this idea. And a small staff of almost three people, a little over three people, I mean, they had a part-time people, come, but they generated over four years, $50 million in new money coming into Denver just by coordinating the activity of the nonprofit sector. Imagine that potential of electing people like that. But not only people like that who see the money side, but also realize that there's two big armies of people coming together. A generation coming up who wants to make its, wants to, if I may generalize, merge spirituality, lifestyle, income, saying in effect, look, I got to pay my bills. I can't work for nothing. But if I can find a job where I don't do harm, I do good, sign me up. And there's an army of young people, an army of them, coming in looking for that kind of work. And imagine that potential. At the same time, an older generation, people like me, every single day, saying, in effect, it's not over yet. I got another 10 or 20 years left. And I want to stay active. I want to stay engaged. I don't want to necessarily just go down and chop vegetables every day. I want to find a way to really lift this town up. Imagine what's there. I do. And that's what I'm doing. And that's why I'm honored to be here today. I'm not trying to sell you a product. I'm just talking about an idea. You know, an idea that you can interpret any way. This is what I've done. I go around, I spent the first 10 years of my career talking about the kitchen and saying, if you want to open a kitchen, I'll help you any way I can. And what was glorious is we watched an explosion of ideas happen all across America, all across America, where people, again, wrestle themselves free of this idea that all they can do is serve the poor uh, and started to really embrace this idea. Maybe there's something new here. Maybe we can make money. Maybe we can be an employer. Maybe we can pay a living wage. Maybe we can demonstrate that what people think is impossible actually is pretty possible. And not only that, it's the exact kind of business that any mayor, any city council, uh, city council member, any governor should say, how can I get more of those? That's what I had hoped when President Obama came. And it didn't happen with this president, but it's going to happen with the president down the road. This can't be ignored any longer. You can't take the third biggest industry in America and not channel that energy, not be open to reinterpreting what has always been one of the best parts of America, the way we treat each other, the way we stand together, and the opportunity we have if we do that. Thank you all very, very much for this time. And thank you all for coming. Uh, if everything goes well, this will be the first in a series of talks that we're going to do. And um, Robert is sort of a spiritual guru of the museum here. And I uh, want to thank him again, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you.